so the subject is, um, I'm not sure how familiar you guys are with the history of El Salvador and the U.S. involvement there, yeah. Um, you know, so, so basically the, the short version of the history is that um, a, a civil war broke out in El Salvador and the U.S. got heavily involved on the behalf of the right-wing government. Um, it was sort of the Iraq War of its time or the Vietnam War, kind of right in between there. Um, and our allies were implicated in some of the most egregious human rights abuses, um, one of the dirtiest, dirty wars um, that we've been involved in um, that really traumatized the country. And, um, you know, 500,000 Salvadorans made their way to the U.S. Um, Guatemalans as well were, were, were involved in a terribly bloody civil war that, that the U.S. had taken a side in as well. Um, and as those refugees, sort of de facto refugees, washed up in Los Angeles, um, some of them got involved in gang activity. Um, I think it's, you know, President Trump likes to use MS-13 as uh, sort of a, he pretends like it's a Salvadoran import, something that was imported to the U.S. from Salvador. It's really an American export. Um, the gang really formed in response to uh, the sort of being preyed on by other Latin, Latino and, and African-American gangs. Um, and really, it was an L.A. gang culture that, uh, that gave, gave birth to MS-13. Uh, under Bill Clinton, um, the U.S. started to, to deport um, Salvadorans, immigrants who uh, had a, a criminal conviction en masse back to these countries in the Northern Triangle. Um, and so I took the seeds of these gang cultures and dropped them in the petri, petri dish of Honduras, Guatemala, El Salvador. Today, those are some of the most, have the most staggering murder rates in the world. Um, and so this, uh, this, this picks up at, at where we're beginning is about a third of the way into the book. And um, this is sort of the first Salvadoran-born generation of the gang um, after these American transplants bring this, this gang culture and their, their networks and their sort of criminal sophistication, uh, it becomes something in the sort of lawless and traumatized um, sort of Hobbesian um, environment. It becomes something much more um, brutal. Um, and the Salvadoran state, you know, uh, has their share of complicity and culpability, things that have really backfired. Uh, one of them is this Plan Mano Dura, which means the uh, the Plan of the Iron Fist. And it's a militarized mass incarceration approach to the gangs. Um, and for various reasons, it's really backfired. Um, it was sort of a publicity exercise. I, I talked to uh, the former National Police Chief of El Salvador, who admitted that, you know, Plan Mano Dura was a plan in quotes, what he said, that there was no real theory to it or jurisprudence or it wasn't based on any um, sort of policing strategy. It was really a let's get tough on the gangs. Uh, and in response, the, it, the, it wrapped up a lot of young men uh, and sort of turned in these prisons, they turned into sort of finishing schools for the gangs where um, the gangs sort of ran the prisons and established a, a new hierarchy that really allowed them to rule uh, the country even from behind these prison walls. So this is um, a young man I call Fausto, and this is uh, you know his story as he as he gets pulled into this. Killing came easily enough for Cesar the first time. To say otherwise would be a lie. He had grown up in a family of five that seemed no different from most of the other families on the block. His father worked the graveyard shift as a car lot security guard, splitting his time between two families, while his mother washed clothes in other people's homes. They both worked hard to provide what they could. But something was missing, and Cesar went looking for it in the streets. Where he lived, there wasn't much to do. The lone, trash-strewn soccer field was unusable. He wanted to be part of something. In his neighborhood, the only thing he could think to be a part of was a gang. The neighborhood then was still dominated by the Mara Salvatrucha thugs who had abused Cesar on his way to school, smacking him in the head and taking his money. So this is, he, he becomes a, a member of a gang called Barrio 18, which is the sort of arch rival of MS-13 that was also deported from, um, refers to 18th Street in Los Angeles. By his early teens, however, a clique from Barrio 18 had expanded to the borders of the neighborhood and was looking for recruits to help eliminate their rivals. In 2002, when gang members approached him about collaborating as a lookout, a post day, Cesar agreed. 
For the next couple years, his main job was to spot any MS members who were drunk or alone with their guard down. Then he would tick up, tip off the shot caller, the palabrero, who would send someone to kill them. Along the way, the gang drew him in closer. The appeal was undeniable. The palabrero had money, he had women, he had drugs. He smoked and drank, and no one told him what, he could, no one told him what to do. The other veteranos groomed Cesar as well, telling him they were going to be his brothers, his family. They would look out for him. When Cesar was 17, he and the other lookouts were offered the chance to become full-fledged full mareros. He didn't have to think twice. In the last few years, they had helped kill nearly 20 MS members. Refusing the offer would make one a liability, but that never even entered into Cesar's calculation. He wanted in whatever the price. A few years earlier, the only cost of initiation was the swarm of fists he'd endure in the ritual 18-second beatdown, but times were changing. The firm hand of the state was around everyone's throat. Too many were turning informant, and those without blood on their hands were always the first to talk. Now everyone first had to kill to join the gang. The palabreo gave Cesar a gun, named the MS member that he should kill in the time to strike. Then he dispatched him to their enemy's territory. When the hour came, Cesar spotted his target loitering on the corner and paused to study him from a distance. He'd known the young man casually across the divide of the neighborhood's shifting boundaries, but Cesar's own gang affiliation was still a secret. He scanned the faces on the street, worried he might be recognized, and watched for any passing police patrols. When the street was clear, he approached his victim and greeted him warmly. The young man was waiting for his girlfriend, he said. Cesar nodded, chatting him up for a brief moment. Then in a flash, he pulled out the pistol. The other boy bolted, trying to run, but Cesar was at nearly point-blank range and squeezed off a round that caught the boy in the head. Then, for good measure, he emptied the revolver into his victim's body on the pavement. Cesar fled, making his way quickly through the startled streets. Once home, he took a shower. Killing was easy, he realized. When the moment came, he had acted on instinct and adrenaline, nothing more. Afterward, he felt no guilt or sense of any unseen boundary crossed. He felt nothing. So Cesar changed his clothes and returned to the crime scene, blending into the crowd milling around the body. Another gang member would later tell him that in Los Angeles, the police had such training and technical resources that they nearly always got to the bottom of a murder. Here, an hour after his first kill, the police hadn't even arrived to take note of the corpse. As soon as Cesar was jumped in, he realized he'd been lied to. The gang was supposed to be a tribe of equals, but once he became a homeboy, the facade of egalitarianism fell away. There was a hierarchy. The shot caller had value, and the killer had value. The rest had no voice. Cesar wanted to become the most violent of them all, like everyone else did. So for respect, he would kill again and again and again. In time, he learned another truth. He could also get respect by the method he used to kill. Cesar could kill with the gun, or he could kill with the machete, a brutality normally reserved for traitors and informants. There was a logic to the macabre choice. To take a man apart with a machete, piece by piece, was to send a message to his friends as well as his enemies. With a machete, Cesar wielded fear. Before Manadura, the clique was a neighborhood entity, the only homeboys one would know were the other members of his own clique, and rarely did he know anyone at all outside that circle. But prison was a blender. Assessor and his crew began getting scooped up and shuffled through dozens of jails. They mixed with other members of Barrio 18. Soon they were comparing notes, sharing strategies, and forging alliances. If you need to kill someone in your neighborhood, call me and I'll send guys who won't be recognized to pull the trigger. The cliques were still autonomous, loosely affiliated cells, but they'd begun to realize what they shared in common and new hierarchies were forming amid the shuffling of ranks in gang-segregated prisons. In the process, they were becoming something bigger. With these new lines of communication, an idea traveled quickly. The idea that would establish the gang's stranglehold over the economy, escalate the war between them, and transform their raison d'etre came down as an order from the gang's ranks in prison in 2006. Prominent voices in Mara Salvatrucha, whose new cast of leaders was then coalescing, were also calling for extortion at a level of something like national policy to support members jailed in the government's ongoing campaign. At the micro level of Cesar's block, however, he had first heard about La Renta from an American he knew only as Mr. Lonely. It was fitting. The Southern California gangbangers had given them their culture and criminal sophistication, like the baggy clothes and the hand signals they used to communicate. It was the Americans whose tattoos they had copied, and the Americans again who convinced them to stop making tattoos mandatory. That's how the police were spotting them. For Cesar, extortion was the most important idea the Americans brought. Extortion gave the gang a new level of capacity and control. With money, the Palabrero could buy cell phones so that everyone was in constant communication. If he landed in jail, he could get a lawyer. With money, Cesar found he could get away with anything in El Salvador. 
By the time he became a shot caller, Cesar had murdered 20 people. In theory, the spoils of that violence were supposed to be communal, but accounting was left to the palabrero. Gang members didn't receive a salary, relying instead on their leader to take, to take care of their needs, which were often humble, like a place to live if their families kicked them out, or money to buy a new pair of shoes. Because police were always confiscating their weapons, a big line item in his budget went to rearming, most often with the complicity of the five cops who lived in the area that he controlled, and would confiscate guns from other cliques in the zones where they patrolled, and send them back to him, and sell them back to him in turn, perpetuating a cycle. At other times, he would travel to the blind spots along the Guatemalan border, where liberal American gun policies contributed a flow of new weapons to the thriving cross-border cross -border contraband trade. Even after accounting for such expenses, however, a margin of opportunity remained. One driver paid Cesar $2,000 a month for the right to deliver beer to the neighborhood, and he would often take in as much as $10,000 each month, enough to embezzle a few thousand for himself. <clears throat> but Cesar came to see that extortion had another hidden cost. It made the gangs parasites in their communities, exacerbating the cycle of residents informing and his clique murdering informants. This war making on all fronts in which each gang was now engaged against the state, its rival, and its neighbors, produced a period of internal consolidation that gave rise to a new leadership. The waves of violence and repression escalated in the summer of 2010, when a faction of Barrio 18 gave the country a terrifying glimpse of what it had become. The plan, as Cesar understood it, had only been to kill the driver and the fare collector, a warning to the bus company's owner to pay the extortion demanded for the route, nothing more. But things got out of hand. On June 20th, gang members machine gunned a bus as it passed through the city center of Mexicanos, then doused it in gasoline and set it on fire. 17 passengers burned alive inside. No one seemed to know why it had happened, but it had, and it quickly ushered in a new reality. <clears throat> uh, I'll skip ahead here to, um, to kind of the end of this section because this is a point that I learned from, from Cesar that really helped um, sort of crystallize what I was, what, what I was seeing in El Salvador. Um, so this war between the, the state and the gangs ramps up and gets more and more violent and more and more brutal. Um, <clears throat> amid the escalating madness, Cesar landed in prison once more. The prospect of serious jail time had a way of clarifying things. Ever since he'd killed enough people to call the shots himself, and all the older veterans were dead or in jail, Cesar had been in a position to betray those around him. By now, the leadership knew he had been stealing money and sleeping with other members' girlfriends, an abuse of power for which he might be killed, or at the very least, subjected to repeated brutalities in a prison the gang controlled. When police offered him a chance to become an informant, he accepted. In exchange for his continued cooperation building a case against his gang, Cesar was freed to fend for himself. He found refuge, ironically, in Mara Salvatrucha territory. Neither his neighbors nor co-workers in the civilian job he landed knew anything about his former ties or the 26 lives he had taken. His new life was to be a modest one, lived in constant fear of discovery. One day, he recognized two Barrio 18 members he knew on a public bus. Cesar got off quickly and slipped away, but it was a reminder that in El Salvador, no one can hide forever. In time, it's likely he will meet the same end as his victims, and so be it. Cesar's sins, he knew, were his own. The kids he had grown up with had all come from poor, broken families like his, and yet some became doctors and lawyers. Cesar had made his own choices. But still, as he watched the new left-wing government borrow straight from the right's playbook, he recognized something about the role of the gangs. They made an awfully convenient scapegoat. Who benefits? The drug dealer, the arms trafficker, the oligarch who cheats the tax system. In a society increasingly beset by secret iniquities, the gangs were the grimace and public face the rest could hide behind. Um, so I'll just talk for a while, and then we can open it up to questions. Um, you know, my work as a journalist is focused. I was a Cold War kid, and so, you know, there was this idea at the end of the Cold War that this was the end of history, and that, you know, liberal democracy and, and free markets were going to, um, you know, were, were going to, to, to build a, a, a prosperous, globalizing world, and that, you know, the competition for resources and the sort of bloody cycles of history uh, had come to an end. Um, I, so a lot of my work, I think, was kind of interested in that, I'd, testing that idea and going to a lot of the places, uh, you know, the sort of poor and broken corners of the world that, that um, didn't have a Marshall Plan to bail them out after, like Europe did, uh, where things were getting worse and worse. 
and I was particularly interested in places where the line between rich and poor was was um, so tangible and palpable. I was in Europe for kind of based in Europe for a while, covering the Middle East, um, and you know I was there in Libya during the civil war, looking at uh, the boat people who were trying to flee and go to Europe, um, because you've got you know the world's richest countries, the world's oldest populations. Um, lowest birth rates, and then you know North Africa. You've got uh, just the opposite. You know you've got um, huge birth rates. You've got young youth demographic bulge. Um, you have a lot of fragile, fragile states and instability. And at some points, you know it's it's a hundred hundred miles from Tunisia or from Libya to the Italian island of Lampedusa. So I went there to try to take that boat across, um, and spend a few years looking at Europe's. Um, assimilation challenges under these new populations that were coming in from, from the Middle East, from first from Libya and then from, from Syria. Um, I looked at, I did a profile of a dead Danish gangster turned jihadi. Um, I looked at sort of how Angela Merkel in Germany was, was trying to um, sort of honor the commitments that, um, the sort of post-World War II commitments that uh, you know, European governments that the American government um, have said, you know, uh, that they were going to do taking in refugees, uh, sharing that refugee burden. Um, and then, you know, in about 2012, 2013, when we had, do you guys remember the 100,000 unaccompanied minors showing up in San Diego at about that time? It's in kind of the start of this um, news story about the border crisis. Um, you know, I went. I realized that we had something similar uh, to, to the Syrian refugee crisis happening kind of on our own border. Um, as Trump came into office, so I was looking for a way to get down to El Salvador and kind of, and kind of write about, um, you know, America's own role in that, in that crisis, uh, because it's, it's um, most people, I think, in, in casual conversation, most of the media coverage don't have a lot of historical context um, that, you know, 70% of the people showing up on our southern border are from these three countries. Um, in 2010 or 11, we, they outpaced uh, Mexico uh, as, as you know, a source country of origin, even though Mexico has a population four times as big as all three of these countries combined. Um, as Trump came into office, you know, it, it was pretty clear his first State of the Union, he started to talk about MS-13, call him a savage gang. They were sort of his go-to um, defense for his dramatic overhaul of uh, American asylum system. And, you know, one of the things that I learned, um, I was working on a documentary series about this as well, and one of the things that I learned talking to these immigration lawyers is that, you know, every time there's the Muslim ban, maybe every time there's, um, you know, sending troops down to the border to meet these caravans, Every time there's, uh, you know, kind of pick, pick any one of these big scandals that, that Trump uh, gets involved with, we think of these as sort of reactionary uh, blunders. But actually what the immigration lawyers were telling me is that now what they learned was that whenever something was happening in the headlines, whenever there's a big Trump sort of circus, um, there was something really calibrated happening in the shadows. And that... In some ways, while Trump struggled to erect a, a visible and physical border wall, the real border um, has been uh, this whole raft of changes that, uh, that happen in the shadows and make it so much harder for, for anyone that have basically turned the screws all the way on the asylum system. And that's coming from, from you know, sort of small but important policy decisions that people like Stephen Miller are advising the government on. Um, so as, as MS-13 became so sort of central to what the messaging coming out of the White House was, uh, you know, I decided to sort of frame this around um, the gangs. Sometimes when you're writing about human rights abuses, you write about the villains because they're more colorful. And um, one of the things that I realized in the process um, was, was not just that um, you know, the U.S. had some responsibility for, for sending and deporting a lot of these people, um, but that... Uh, you know, even more so, so much of the crisis today has to do with this 12-year bloody war that sort of turned uh, 
the course of the country's evolution. Um, and I, I kind of write about it as, as uh, you know, people talked about um, the U.S. brokered peace plan that ended this war being like a success story. Like El Salvador was one of these stories that the international media had been covering the war, got a lot of attention. It was kind of in the American conscious, consciousness. Uh, and as soon as that was over, the story that we told was sort of that, that you know, we ended that war and that it was uh, uh, a success story, that the, the two armed groups became political parties and they stopped fighting and they competed at the ballot box. Um, but what you look behind what was happening with that is you start to see the way that the violent violence has increasingly, um, it's ebbed and flowed, but it's, it's come back uh, pretty gradually and pretty steadily. Uh, the war has never really ended in some ways. Um, and that uh, the Salvadoran government too had, uh, you know, its share of, of culpability in that. Um, when, I, when I headed down to El Salvador, my goal initially was just to try to talk to, to gang members from different periods, you know, from guys who joined the gang in LA. I interviewed one of the founders, um, you know, then these sort of guys like Cesar who were the first generation of Salvadoran born ones. Um, but when I got down there to El Salvador, it was, uh, it was tricky. The access situation had sort of changed. Um, there had been this truce that the government had negotiated between the two gangs. And the government never came out and, and sort of owned it and said, hey, we're, doing, we're putting a truce together. But um, a very good investigative uh, news site down there, uh, El Faro, found out that the government had moved gang members from maximum security and put these guys in sort of like medium minimum security so they could start meeting with their associates. And um, they kind of broke the story that there was this sort of government brokered truce. And overnight, uh, murders, the murder rate plummeted by half. Uh, and people were shocked that the gangs had this sort of coherence that they could, you know, decide to stop killing and, and, and that they would, um, their, their lower ranking soldiers would follow those orders. That had lasted about a year and a half. And when it, when it came apart, um, violence came back at levels that hadn't seen, been seen since the most violent peak of the Civil War. And the gangs, you could just tell that something had changed. They had this new sort of coherence. They had different weapons. I was out embedded with a, a sort of SWAT, anti-gang sort of commando unit on the streets, driving around looking for trouble. And um, you know, every time we got out of the out of the, the car in a gang neighborhood, we had to leave somebody in the car to watch it because the gangs had started throwing grenades uh, and, and using explosives in that way. And no one knew where they got their grenades from. The weapons were bigger. They had these you know assault rifles, AK-47s and M16s, and they they. They weren't your neighborhood guys anymore. They were fighting with sort of advanced paramilitary tactics in some ways. And so what I was, you know, where I went down there thinking this was going to be as simple as kind of finding different guys from different phases of the gang's evolution and telling the story through their eyes, I started to realize that there was something much more sinister going on in the background behind all of this. And so um, what the, the book becomes in the second half is sort of trying to unpack this sort of deal with the devil that the... Um, that the defense ministry had brokered with these gangs and given them um, military weapons and training and a lot of money. Um, and what came out of that period, it was sort of the turning point of the gang crisis in Latin America, according to some, some analysts, that not only did they have you know, this new cohesion, but they also knew that they had political party power and that they could affect change by putting more or fewer bodies on the street. Um, so what the gangs have become is something much more complex. I kind of see it as like a state within a state uh, in El Salvador and, and also in Honduras. Um, you know, I, I think the the other thing that I learned is that um, is that these is that the uh, yeah the governments are, there are allies that people who are taking hundreds of million dollars in American military aid to fight these gangs using a strategy that has been that has sort of backfired. Um, because of corruption, um, some of those, some of that money and weapons are, are ending up in the hands of the gang members themselves, and there's a sort of willful blindness to the whole thing. Um, some of my sources, a member of Congress who knows El Salvador really well, said, "You know, it's just like back in the Civil War when some of our allies were doing the worst things ever to people, uh, massacring civilians, uh, you know, macheting people to death and leaving the bodies out as sort of warning signs." 
and that you know confronted with evidence that that this is what American military support is doing people in the establishment in Washington sort of just turned a blind eye to it and that you know that's going that's going on today um, I think there's also a, a big question about you know whether these gang members are some people write about the gang members as like a victims of this um, social order and uh, a sort of violent but predictable response to the situation they're in. Other people write about them as if they're this sophisticated Mexican cartel. Um, and the reality is a little bit of both and, and not quite either, but, but I do think that, um, that they're becoming something uh, much more sophisticated and something much scarier. And that um, while there has been a lot of attention to the military side of things, there's been very little attention paid to the, to the prevention side and to trying to get people um, jobs, get people ways out. Um, I think Obama had done, after 100,000 kids show up on the San Diego border, uh, they had looked at some of the drivers of, of why people were leaving and had decided that um, you know, there was a, a restriction on any US aid going to organizations that worked with, with gang members. Uh, and he softened that because to, to try to sort of to give um, give some of these prevention measures a, a pass, uh, and I think that seems to be on the chopping block now with Trump. So we're going back to you know what has sort of failed time and again um, in El Salvador. Let's open up for questions. Maybe um, do you guys have any? Anyone have any questions? Yeah. Okay. So there's with these like. You know, these gangs in uh, El Salvador or uh, Mexico or, or, you know, Mexican cartels or, you know, Colombia in the 1980s. It's kind of like drug organizations that are very organized and have, you know, a massive amount of like, political control. Um, you know, where does the solution begin with that kind of thing? Like, is it just going to address the social ills that the country's facing? Or how do you, like, start finding a solution when they have so much political power that they can't really get to, like, be touched directly? Yeah. I mean, I think that's the million dollar question, right? Is, is, is what's the solution? Um, I think there's some segment of the gang, I'll tell you what um, a gang member that I call Manuel told me. You know, he was a guy who um, had been introduced to the gang by his, uh, his older cousin from Los Angeles and was sort of the first generation of, of Salvadorans when these guys were, it was really, they were looking for belonging. You know, it was sort of selling a substitute family. And in a country where a fifth of the population had been driven out and families had been split up um, and, you know, people were physically injured and, and traumatized and, and obviously mentally the whole country was sort of given over to a militarization of the mind, as one uh, sociologist called it. Um, that was a really potent combination. You know, a lot of these guys were, were seeking something to belong to um, because of very direct experiences of dislocation from the war. Um, it became something else. It became a business in some ways. It became um, something much more sophisticated. But what he said is, you know, eighty percent of these guys right now would would quit if you gave them a job. And there are sort of examples of that where. Um, I think what made the truce so tragic and, and to understand what was behind the truce, such a tragic thing, um, because on the surface it looked like finally, you know, some jobs programs were going to come into these marginalized communities where there have just been no economic reforms. You know, the, the same 14 families that control El Salvador and have for a century uh, still, still, run, uh, still run the show. Uh, and, and in some ways now you're kind of born into a neighborhood and, and that's your fate. You know, you have to find some way to collaborate with the gang. Um, as somebody told me, if you're a young woman and a gang member takes a fancy to you, uh, that's a fate from which no one can save you. Um, so women bear the, the brunt of the violence, uh, often. But what he said is that, um, you know, 80% of these guys, if you give them a job, um, and, and that's what you know, people had been asking for for a really long time. There was one program that was supposed to do that. And what I learned in the course of my reporting was um, it was actually an intelligence gathering operation. And so when gang members would come and, and get a job, uh, to keep it, they had to rat out everybody in their clique. And uh, 
the gang, uh, the gang leader, El Diablito, uh, told, told all my sources, you know, y- you can't imagine how many people I had to murder because of that, close friends and family, um, because there was such a hunger for, for some sort of jobs program. Um, and, and more often than not, that's the very few times that something like that happens, it's actually something much more sinister, and there's something behind that. Um, I do think that, you know, this Treasury Department restriction on um, funding anything that's that's got a gang member in it, uh, sort of relaxing that and, and, and turning, uh, turning that around was a good idea. Um, so I do think that there are economic forms and jobs programs, rehabilitation programs that could be helpful. Um, one of my sources was a senior intelligence agent in El Salvador, and he said, you know, there's there's just not really anything like a, a national plan. I mean, there's from one administration to the next, they change. People kind of kick the can. Um, and then there's so much corruption now that, you know, uh, that very often uh, the people who would be overseeing some of these things are, are actually complicit uh, in, in dealing with the gang members. I, I think that's kind of what the consensus was from experts, is that some sort of structural reform, some sort of jobs and rehabilitation program, um, you know, to, to sort of change the culture that produces these gangs, these neighborhoods that you're sort of born into. Instead, what the, what the government's done is sort of alternately bargain and barter with uh, some of the gangs, while they're also waging this, this war, Plan Monodura. Um, I, I, I talked to a Salvadoran police officer who's living in the US now, who was a member of a death squad, and he said that uh, you know that the orders came from the very top of the Salvadoran government to start these death squads um, and really stick it to the gangs. And he describes, as it's in the book, but um, in pretty visceral terms, uh, how they murdered these people, and they were doing it in their police uniforms. Um, so, you know, what that's actually doing now is is sort of producing. I think the other the other really tricky factor is that you've got maybe 60,000 gang members in a country of 6 million, um, but you have another, a whole 10% of the population estimated that's now dependent on the gangs because they're their family members. They don't have jobs. Extortion provides, this is, this is sort of the family's livelihood now that's dependent. So even, even though there are plenty of gang members who would like to leave extortion behind as a strategy, um, you know, they're sort of, that's kind of it right now. Um, and in fact, as the state has turned more and more to the repressive measures, um, you know, what my sources are saying is that, you know, the, the, the death squads will go in and if they can't find gang member A, they'll go after his brothers and sisters. So that's in actually increasing the migration. Basically, when this truce fell apart, um, some of the violence that we're reading about here from MS-13 in New York, in LA, basically it sped up this um, sort of circular revolving door uh, of people getting deported and, and people fleeing and, and that whole process is sped up. And as a result of that, the gang is actually trying to restore its sort of former glory on the West Coast in Los Angeles. This sort of gangs that had been broken up are now, they're trying to revive them. Um, and now the, the headquarters of that, I mean, it's a tricky thing. How do you, how do you, how do you go after gangs that are now transnational in some ways, where, um, you know, it used to be that LA called the shots. What one of my gang sources said is that during the, during the truce, LA sent a, an emissary to find out what the hell was going on. Who were these upstart Salvadorans that had, you know, launched this complicated thing with the government? And uh, he got murdered, uh, the, the, the guy that had been dispatched from LA. Now El Salvador is calling the shots. That's really where the power is, and it, it's actually the, the leadership that's imprisoned there um, that, you know, cheap cell phone technology, they can communicate with their cliques on the West Coast and the East Coast. So it's like, because Central America is such fertile terrain for these gangs, because corruption, because poverty, because now increasingly probably the drug trade, um, it's not a problem that you can really wall off it's, it's, it's got seeds in both countries now. And um, so it makes it all the more, all the more, all the trickier. I do think, you know, another of my sources, uh, who is a very smart and wry sort of observer of life, um, had been a member of the GRIA's high command during the war, and now is sort of disgusted with the whole political situation in El Salvador. 
he said, um, you know, you need both. You need the carrot and the stick, you know, like he wasn't saying that you need to take some form of, you know, going after gangs, imprisoning people, trying cases against them. Um, but there's just no, there's never been a carrot, you know, it's just the stick and the people who use the stick are using it for political purposes. There's not really any sort of sophisticated uh, approach. And I think the U.S. is also complicit in that. This is sort of a model that the U.S. has supported. Uh, it was sort of based on um, Rudolph Giuliani's tenure in New York and his broken windows uh, policies. He, Rudy Gi Giuliani has been down to, I can't remember if it was, I think it was Honduras maybe, he was paid, his security firm was paid hundreds of thousands of dollars for an appearance that he went to sort of raise the flag and rally the troops down there. Um, and there's just not, I think the other aspect of it is that um, this Salvadoran intelligence guy says, hey, I tip off the CIA. I've got a colleague who's a real straight shooter in the CIA. And I'm like, um, you know, your Southern Command that is, is monitoring the boats that are coming up with the drugs, you know, CIA, DEA, and their Salvadoran counterparts all get together and, you know, on a map and, and watch these, decide which boats to go after. The guy that the Salvadoran government's sending is the liaison between the government and the cartels, the Salvadoran cartels. Um, and he's giving you guys bad intel. He's, you're only going after his enemies, basically. Um, and the CIA guy hasn't, you know, the, this, whenever he shares that sort of information, nothing happens. So the Congressman McGovern that I said, talked to is like, yeah, I think, I think we know what's going on, but, you know, if, I think there's just so much bureaucratic inertia, uh, and especially with this administration, Trump just doesn't give two shits about human rights, was his quote. Um, so it sort of freed the hand of a lot of these guys down there. They know they're they're going to get away with it. I think Hondur Honduras is uh, is just the most depressing place that I've been. Uh, I was talking to a hitman who had 150 murders under his belt and was explaining how MS is in bed with the cops down there and the military is involved in the drug trafficking and. The president of Honduras, lo and behold, his brother is indicted in Miami uh, for drug running. And, you know, his brother, the current president, is likely implicated in that as well. He hangs out with Trump, gets private audiences. They're kind of the best of friends. So I think, you know, there's a sense that uh, whatever moral standing we might have had in the region, uh, what might have been a problem of just bureaucratic inertia and fear to really speak out and 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 you know, look at how this money's being spent has become just sort of a, the gloves are off um, for crap members of, of the establishment down there. Yeah. Uh, I have three questions. Number one is, how do you get the nerve to go into these highly dangerous places? Uh, second question is, why haven't the gangs declared war on the oligarchs? These 14 families seem to me that would be the most sensible thing to do. That's, a, that's an interesting point. And isn't the problem that all of our political systems are so corrupt now and it's so progressive, it's just, it's the way things are done. And, you know, as somebody who was born in 1949, I think it's outrageous, mm -hmm. especially given the hogwash we were fed growing up. But yeah. if you do that in Rowlett, we're going to have to do some unraveling at home, too. That's a very good point. Um, what was the first question there? That was a three-part question. The first part, oh, get the nerve to get in there. Um, let me ask. I'll do these in reverse order. So <laughs> number three. Uh, yeah, I think um, I don't know where that process starts of unraveling it. I, I think you're right. I think we've seen corruption in our own government right now at the highest levels. Um, I think... Uh, you know, the other thing, how do, how do these drugs get in, across the border? Well, a lot of it's bribing. You know, if you got the money, you can buy off the border guard, right? Um, I was working on another story for this documentary with somebody who is uh, an undercover asset for U.S. law enforcement, and, you know, he's working on a big case uh, with a crap border guard who's working with the cartels to, to, bring, to bring. Everyone's got a price, you know? And it's happening here, it's happening there. I think it does seem to me as a sort of observer, you know, uh, that the ability to shock people can be a really great, can be a really great social capacity. I think when, when Watergate happened, everyone was kind of incensed. And 
the narrative we told ourselves is that when these truths, whether it's a bundad apple or systemic rot, is sort of exposed to the light, that you know action is taken and the society returns to a, a, a state of grace. Um, but now it's you know we're not. Uh, that's that process is not happening. There doesn't seem to be a lot of moral outrage at, at some of some of the abuses. Um, maybe a sort of double think and hypocrisy can be a good thing sometimes if it if it allows you to summon the moral outrage to make changes. Um, your second question was, why don't, why, don't the gangs, why don't the gangs go after the oligarchies? That, that's an interesting question. Um, you know the <laughs> I don't want to get too in the weeds with this, but um, as a part of the truce, the gangs did start to see themselves and really use the, the rhetoric of the guerrillas. And they said, we are the people's true representatives. We're the, the new guerrillas. Um, you know, and they were borrowing these ambush strategies where you, you know, you'd hit a police post, ambush a police post, and then sort of fade into the, country, into the countryside. Um, there was definitely a rhetoric about that that I think they learned uh, in dealing with the government and in, in bartering with them. Uh, why don't they go to the oligarchs? I mean, I think, I don't want to paint the gangs out to be, um, I'm wary of being like, these guys are like a Mexican cartel. We think of it as Mexican cartel, incredibly sophisticated. I mean, these are guys who are still, we're still talking about, you know, tens of thousands of teenagers with, who communicate in spray paint and cell phone text message and don't have a high school diploma, and they lead pretty shitty lives. Um... I think um, now they're they're learning. I think they're getting more sophisticated. I don't know if they um, could go after the. I don't know. I think it's more that they're learning to dance with some of those members of society. What this source told me was that, you know, the. Um, I'll read. I'll read you a little section here from this guy because I liked him. He was so uh, eloquent and lyrical and sort of disenchanted. So this is Dagoberto Gutierrez, who's a, who's a professor of political science and a former member of the Grias High Command. We've had six wars in our history, he said. The first one, the most disgraceful, was in 1524 when the damned Spanish invaded us and did a great deal of damage. Three centuries later, the descendants of those invaders, the newly independent countries ruling an elite, looked to international markets to develop El Salvador's nascent economy. They focused exclusively on indigo, leaving the indigenous masses and the peasant farmers to concentrate on the land where indigo did not grow. Then, in the mid-19th century, chemical dyes were invented and the market for indigo plummeted. The landowning elite replaced indigo with coffee, which grew just fine in the zones occupied by the country's poor. A massive land distribution followed that left the vast majority of the population landless and the owners of the new coffee plantations rich. This was the birth of the Salvadoran oligarchy. Quote, here the owners are members of the same oligarchy that in 1864 began accumulating capital, destroying the communal land, he said. Those landowners ruled with a feudal authority that only grew over time, securing a series of constitutional amendments that granted ever more power to the 14 landowning families that have dominated El Salvador's economic life ever since. These were the conditions that produced the Civil War, he said, and its end did nothing to resolve the underlying inequalities that had given rise to it. So he goes on to say that, you know, there's a neoliberal sort of free market reform that really screwed people over uh, as well under Washington's guidance after the end of the war. Here, he continued, here in my country, the king and the queen is the market. Everything is business, everything is bought, and everything is sold, and everything has a price, even human beings. Today, five blocks dominate the political landscape. The first block is that of the gangs. They have a lot of a lot of economic and financial power, he said. The gangsters are capitalists. The second block is that of the guerrilla, strong capitalists and pensioners. The third block is that of the drug runners, very powerful. All the oligarchy takes part in the drug trafficking. The gringos know it very well, but their hands are tied. Washington cannot act. The fourth block is that of the traditional landowner oligarchy, he continued. And the fifth block is that of the oligarchic financial bourgeoisie. He's a Marxist, so bear with me. The, the language here is a bit loaded. Um, they all know each other. The five blocks do business among themselves. They all know each other, and no one is more powerful than the other. There's no dominant block in this moment. As a result, the political system whose allegiance is divided among these groups is shaky and uncertain. But it is the gangs who are on the rise. The gang is a political and military power, he said. Total control over the territory of the entire country. They control all the communities, all the neighborhoods, and negotiate with all the political parties. Negotiation with the gangs is a fact of life in El Salvador, he said. 
In most communities, the gang is the sovereign, and people must make their daily accommodations with that authority or they will be killed. Businesses negotiate in order to enter the gang's territory, or else their trucks are robbed and their employees murdered. Both political parties negotiate in order to run campaigns. This is reality. But good negotiation requires strength. The gangs are wily and have learned to take advantage of every, at every crossroads, while the Salvadoran state is weak. <clears throat> Um, now the government is determined to annihilate the gang with blood and fire, and it is failing, Gutierrez said, because every political phenomenon needs a political solution. The military way works, but only when it is perfectly managed with fine military coups. coups. But a bloodbath without limits does not work. The government is being defeated, and the gang is on the rise militarily, with military coups that are every time more sophisticated. Um, I asked Gutierrez what this portends for the future. His answer was bleak. The phenomenon that is coming is called Somalization, he said. It is a phenomenon that sociologically began to register many years ago. Today is appearing in the cities. Whole neighborhoods are enclosed and shuttered with gates and bars. Somalization is defined by the fragmentation of power without the state. And there's an agonizing government without prestige and without authority. So Somalization is the process that advances. It is not a good panorama. The oligarchs are not concerned because it is still not their turn, but it will, but it will come. The oligarchs make their enemies the same as them. That's what they did with the guerrilla. He paused but did not look up from his task. Washington is living the worst chapter of its history, he said. It's an empire that has lost its hegemony. And as all empires, it does not realize it has lost it or does not want to accept it. And that means they won't be able to understand what is happening in small countries like mine, so small that it has no value. And this is very dangerous. Although today the gangs comprise members of all the classes, he continued, most are still marginalized young people but now they are to be found in the universities as well. The gangs are training their future lawyers and doctors, economists, and military intelligence officers. A new class consciousness is being born under the noses of the old guard. The oligarchy doesn't realize that power is running out of their hands, he said, that another oligarchy is forming in the hands of the gang. So I think, you know, what's happening now is the gangs are, are sending their lawyers and doctors and military intelligence officers. They're in, enmeshed in some of the very security institutions that are supposed to be charged with their persecution. persecution. Um, they're learning and they're getting savvier and there's some new form that they're evolving into. Um, to the, where do I get the spot to go down to El Salvador and stick my nose in other people's business? Um, you know, there's, I think there are, it's never as, it's never as, is. I think you're supposed to, in these book tours, stand up here and act, you know, care, re reckless and devil may care. Um, but it's never, there's smarter, safer ways to do things. It's never as bad as we like to make it sound over drinking a bar. Um, I think uh, there's calculated risks you can take. Uh, my brother lives in a war zone in a tent and rides a motorcycle in South Sudan doing public health. Uh, stuff uh, with the Carter Center. So, you know, I, I think our w once you do do it a little bit more, your threat perception slips, slips a little bit. I think that's probably part of it. Um, you know, I was, I was riding around with these anti-gang units, uh, and nothing really happened for the, the two weeks that I was doing that. Um, I did notice at the end of my time there in El Salvador that I was talking to uh, people at the center who knew some very important secrets. And, you know, I was talking to a guy who was under surveillance. Um, I was talking to somebody else who was on the cartel's payroll. Uh, I was talking to a prisoner who was close to the gang leadership who's, who's sort of un unwinding a lot of this. So I did start to become a little bit more aware of, you know, my movements and, you know, you know, this sort of security protocol that you can, that you can use. But, but I don't think it's ever, you know, there's ways like like Gutierrez says, there's daily accommodations. You know, there's ways to go into these neighborhoods, and you, when you drive into the gang neighborhoods at night, uh, you have to put down your windows and turn on your interior lights in the car and drive very slowly. And I was going with um, with somebody who kind of knew the protocol. You know, um, I think that's yeah. I, I think that's kind of thank you. Very great. Thank you. That's very nice. Very nice. That's very nice. Uh, and uh, yeah, I was talking about that too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, what was your experience with that? Um, well, I was um, right before the Civil War ended, and so that was in um, 90 and 91, and then I went right after it ended in 92 and I came back in 94. Um, it was intense. It was intense. Yeah, I went um, on an 
cover, we were in a lot of danger, we, it was, you know, the people around us were in a lot of risk. It was, I mean, it was a very meaningful thing to do because it was um, expressing solidarity with people in the U.S. was funding this war, and so meeting people who were, have been impacted and showing them, okay, there's people in the U.S. that actually want to hear your stories and understand what's actually going on and want to try to change the policy. So it was really meaningful work. Um, but yeah, that, it was it was intense and dangerous. And I did, have, I did get into some really bad situations when I was 19 at the time. So. Wow. <laughs> yeah, I just kind of didn't really, really realize what I was getting into. Um, but it was definitely an amazing coming of age experience. Uh, I bet. I bet. Um, well, good for you. And it's, it's so heartbreaking to hear these stories now and kind of what, what has happened to that, you know, what has happened to that part of history in El Salvador and the state of society right now. So. Yeah, it is. I'm Sure. I mean, yeah, I, you know, I, I think as I started to learn more about this, I realized that there was sort of, yeah, not that America is the only country that um, goes blundering around the world, but I do think there's something uniquely uh, amnesiac about the way that we do it. And I think with, when I started to look into El Salvador history, there's just, you can kind of see these cycles, you know, um, I think the dialogue, what McGovern, the, the congressman, said to me as he said, you know, um, I'm a member of Congress. I know El Salvador really well. I can't get anyone to listen to me, you know. And at the level that we're having this conversation in the media, it's like, um, you know, the, the whole narrative is that these are all bad actors and these are, you know, people trying to take advantage of the American asylum system. And, you know, these are men and women and children who are fleeing outrageous violence and, and horrible atrocities. And... Um, we have a large hand in that, and in, in what got this phenomenon to this this state, going back to the war that we took a side in, dragged out for 12 years, killed 80,000 people, and then he said we sort of packed up and walked away, <laughs> cut off cut off most of our aid, and um, and walked away. And so you know, I think that's the sort of central. Uh, through point in this story, and then you know now the, the everyone thinks the border this border story starts at at Mexico at Mexico or yesterday, you know, and and there's a there's a whole cycle here to American foreign policy that has come back. There's um one of the one of the writers that I'm sure you know that uh, influenced me a lot, Mark Danner. Um, he wrote a story called The Truth of El Mazote, where he went uh, back and and looked at um, one of the worst massacres of the Salvadoran Civil War when hundreds of as many as maybe as a thousand uh, villagers were massacred with machete by the uh, a U.S. trained and created uh, unit uh, in this in the in the uh, Salvadoran military, um, and that his writing kind of gave birth and a lot of course galvanized the sort of human rights watch, you know, and, and human rights uh, movements in the U.S. He he was very nice to contribute a nice blurb. At the beginning of the book, and I think he says very, um, very eloquently here in the middle of this part. Um, William Wheeler dramatizes with almost painful immediacy a vital truth that all the fevered talk about a crisis at the border is really an ignorant lament about what three decades of U.S. foreign policy have wrought. At its core, the so called crisis is about what we as Americans have done to El Salvador and its Central American neighbors to confront the savage violence ripping through those countries and sending their citizens on a desperate flight north. It's ultimately to find oneself gazing at the American face in the mirror. Um, you know, couldn't, couldn't, couldn't have said it better than that. Any other questions? Yeah. Um, do you, I think if you agree with Gutierrez's assessment of the balance of the power there, and you kind of touched on it, they give him sort of a current policy, the fact that he's fucking more than he's ready for him also for us. It seems like it's just going to make the situation worse. How does that affect the balance of power? Are we going to sort of just see the hands go Are they the dominant power in El Salvador? Is that going to have to overcome that? And how's that going to happen? Yeah, um, great question. So, the question was how uh, is U.S. foreign policy under Trump or under Stephen Miller uh, going to affect the balance of power? 
in El Salvador? Do I agree with Gutierrez that the gangs are really on the rise? I do. I mean, I think, you know, with the caveat that, um, that these are still poor guys without a, you know, historically without even a, a, a great line of, um, of how to make a living. And, and, you know, I, 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 there's terrible marginalization that's really perpetuating this. Uh, and the gangs are not, um, you know, uh, heavily implicated in the drug trade or in the drug trafficking in El Salvador in the way that they, they seem to be more so in Honduras. Uh, but I, yeah, I think he's right. I think that, um, you know, there were gang members inserted. I've seen some of the military records of, of gang members allegedly inserted into the military and police. Um, you know, there have been these guys that have, uh, you know, as part of the truce negotiation, they sent some of these guys to college, you know. Another friend of mine down there um, knows somebody who is, works in City Hall in one of the municipalities and they went out and got hammered one night with one of their coworkers who's a preppy, good looking, you know, square jawed, straight shooter, and they got him hammered, or they all got hammered. And at the end of the night, uh, they take, took the guy home and he stripped down to his boxers to get in bed and he had Barrio de S. E. Ocho tattoos all on the inside of his legs, you know. Um, I think that uh, you know, MS being involved in, in the drug trade in Honduras. You know, I've also heard that they're basically controlling the tourist industry there in, in Honduras as well. Um, I think they're on the rise. I don't really know what it's evolving towards. Um, I think it's something new. I, I don't know if it looks more like the cartels in Mexico, um, this longtime gang expert and Fordham murder, murder cop that I talked to, Al Valdez, says that um, you know the gangs on the east and west coast have started. They started this evolution of uh, you know like monthly meetings and paying dues and uh, officers and different sort of ranks. And there was just sort of a a new uh, formalization of the gang structure that he said um, was right before happened as well in the gangs of New York a hundred years earlier, where you know these the gangs were always sort of eth the new ethnic groups that would come into these neighborhoods and then they'd, they'd start the new gang or, or, or become a gang. And right, he saw some, something happen historically similar right before La Cosa Nostra and the rise of the Italian mafia internationally. So his sense is that there might be a brown mafia, as he calls it, that has, you know, outposts in Europe, has, you know, connections to American cities and is sort of headquartered um, out, of, out of Honduras, El Salvador. He said that the FBI has... Um, intercepted phone calls where they've got, you know, gang members from all three places on the line, you know, having these meetings. I don't totally know what it looks like. Um, I think it's something new, you know, and I think it's one of these sort of tales of globalization, the dark side of globalization. So, uh, of course, the whole history of the United States involvement, uh, neo-colonial involvement in Latin America is really long and everything, but, uh, you know, Trump is correct, but not in the same way as the Obama administration or Hillary, for instance, uh, because the whole history of neo-colonial, you know, American dominance is correct, you know, for the oligarchy of the United States. So, uh, whenever they get somebody like um, Zelaya, who might have actually done something positive in Honduras, they overthrow it. So it just seems to me that they really don't care about this stuff. You know, that is maybe it's even in their interest. You know, they're controlling elites of the United States, and uh, you know they don't they don't care how many. You know, if people are coming to our border and everything, that's just a political football that they use. But they really don't care about that. They don't really care about the drug trade. You know, what do you think about that? I mean, I think uh, I don't have any real insight into what's going on in any of these people's minds. Uh, but I do agree with, you know, the characterization that it, it's sort of returning to the playbook of the 80s where we're bat backing bad actors. Uh, for you know what some would say are very short-sighted political gains, um, yeah, I think 
Hillary Clinton's, uh, I think our policy in Honduras is pretty, pretty sketchy. I think that's definitely the ouster of Zelaya and Hillary Clinton declining to uh, call a coup a coup because it would cut off American aid to Honduras um, really empowered Hernandez, you know, and, and I was down there doing a story on um, Berta Cáceres. Has anyone ever heard of her name, Berta Cáceres? She's um, a, no, she's called an environmental activist, she's a feminist activist, environmentalist activist, indigenous activist who uh, was murdered in uh, in Honduras, which is like the most dangerous country on, on the planet for environmental activists. And she had scared away had, had sort of beat the drum so loudly and become this real lightning rod and had scared away uh, multilateral lending agencies that were backing a big uh, hydroelectric project. The Honduran elite that helped basically depose Celaya is all uh, mobbed up pretty deep in this spat of hydroelectric dam projects across the country. And... Um, some international advisory panel lawyers came in and, and used cell phone towers and basically unspooled where you could see there were WhatsApp groups that the hitmen were hired by the dam engineers and tied to upper levels of Honduran government. Um, I think the U.S., yeah, is, is sort of, it seems like, it feels like in the region it's, it's the playbook from the 80s again or the 70s or it feels like we're hearkening back to, to those times and that, you know, I, I do think that behind this border crisis is, is sort of the ghosts of those policies and those wars. Um, and it is, as McGovern, as the congressman said to me, he said it can be a, a maddening experience as someone who's trying to get some attention to these, to these issues. Um, so I think that's, you know, that's... Do you think Zelaya could have actually alleviated the situation? I have no insight on that, and I, you know, I wish I, I wish I, I wish I knew more about Zelaya. I, I was down there looking at sort of the environmental activists that are trying to like hold it together, you know, and and kind of carry on Bert's legacy because uh, a lot of them are getting whacked left and right too. Yeah. What does it feel like um, writing about something like this, covering something like this that's so connected to what's happening in the U.S.? Is it the part that we talk about in the media and what they know that you're talking about? And to see it just, you know, there's just such like a profound ignorance of this, mm -hmm. yeah, in, in, in America. Mm -hmm. I mean, how, do you, how do you approach that? Do you trust it? Yeah, I mean, I think you have to make your peace with it at some level. Um, I think, you know, it's frustrating with this particular subject because it was so in the news, you know, like every day with the caravans, with Trump's messaging. And then, you know, now we've gone on to like, we're gonna go to war with Iran. No, we're not, uh, you know, impeachment. There's, there's just so much <laughs> coming out of Washington right now. I think there's a real fatigue, you know, on everyone's part. Um, so it's frustrating in that sense that it sort of feels like it's something very central to what's happening. And 20 years from now, you know, 30 years from now, uh, the changes that, you know, and the asylum policy are, are being made, I think, are, are going to have long-term consequences. And it's kind of lost in the background noise. Uh, you know, I wrestle a lot throughout my career with just, does, you know, does it make a difference? Does anything write or film change anything? Uh, I think you kind of have to have, uh, don't delude yourself, you know, that you're going to come down and fix anything. Um, but I think it's almost like a sort of a spiritual piece that you have to make with the thing that like, you know, you're gonna, um, and, and, you, and, you know, I, we also do this because we like whatever, you know, the ego or the uh, intellectual curiosity. I mean, there's all sorts of reasons that, that why journalists do journalism, but I do think um, it can be a struggle. I think um, a lot of my friends in the Middle East feel the same way, you know, it's like, uh, just getting people to pay attention is hard and um, can be incredibly dispiriting. Um, at the same time, like it was, it was great to have this opportunity to like write at length about this in a way that you know isn't going to be everyone's required reading at summer break. But um, you know, it was nice to feel like uh, I got to sort of unspool this.
Um, so there's a sense of that. There's a doc series that I worked on too called The Trade that's coming out uh, March 6th on Showtime that's pretty extraordinary too. Um, we follow, <sighs> we pick up a scene, a crime scene, murder scene in Honduras um, with a woman whose husband has just been murdered. He had been in MS-13 and had tried to leave the gang and they f want to go to the U.S., and they got caught by Mexican immigration and sent back, and he was murdered. And so we follow her story. as She rides the trains up here and, and um, flees the gang, and we're in with you know Homeland Security and CBP trying to stop the smugglers, and then we're looking at families who are being deported. So we're trying to like document that cycle, you know. Um, and that was cool because it's a different visual medium, and I don't know how many people watch Showtime, <laughs> but. Uh, you know, I do think that there's a chance for that to sort of catch some eyes. And, um, but it all, I mean, also, I don't know about your opinion, but for me, it does also feel like people are in their camps, they're in their polarized camps, and anyone who bothers to seek out information in, you know, in a comprehensive way, it feels like you're almost preaching to the choir in some, some regards, you know, but I still think it's helpful. It's, pro it's better than the alternative, right? You know? Any other questions? Yeah. How do you... Uh... I want to bring this home. I do not want to see the type of widespread violence occur in this country that's occurring in Central America. Even if we're responsible for it, uh, I feel more it's my government's responsibility. It's not me alone, although to the extent I support the government, you know. And I'm compressive, but I don't want to see this violence either. So have you ever been challenged on that story? Yes, the question is, right, so the question is, uh, you know, uh, doesn't Trump have a point in trying to close off the avenues for immigration if uh, we're going to get some bad actors in here that, yeah. But, but there is clearly a, a, a something on the other side of the equation that, that needs to be addressed as well. Yeah, I, I don't I don't want to see um, I, I don't want to see Los Angeles look like uh, Tegucigalpa, Honduras. You know, I think we have a lot of res investigative police resources. I think the other thing with MS-13 is that, um, as one of the gang former gang members said, he's like, you know, Trump is just giving them PR. You know, <laughs> this is all like the best recruiting boon ever. He said they call Trump calls these guys animals. I knew a guy who called himself animal. You know, I mean, these are these people who are trying to to get social capital from that fear. Um, I think um, I think MS thirteen is you know ten thousand. They the, no one really knows how many members there, but but it seems to have been less than ten thousand for the last thirty four years in the U S. I don't think the U S. is really at risk of. Um, becoming like Tegucigalpa. And I think, you know, the, the larger, as, as you probably agree, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but, you know, the, um, the women and children and the, the, the people who are in these caravans that Trump is sort of demonizing are, you know, trying to get away from <laughs> the vast majority of these people have no gang connections. You know, they are, they are very, they're victims, you know, who are, who are fleeing the gang's reach. Um, I think we, you know, have an incredibly... I think the other thing that the other factor is that we have an incredibly um, sophisticated asylum system that that vets people very well. But one of the things that you've seen is that the the tighter control of the border has become the the real beneficiaries are organized crime on the other side. And so you know, and I've talked to a lot of these coyotes. You know, in our, in our series, there's a there's a number of these coyotes who. Um, or you can see how their 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 payroll is. I mean, their their earnings have just gone through the roof because, I mean, this is. I was down in Arizona on the border there between um, near Ajo, Arizona, which is like the most dangerous section of the border. And um, basically, you've got people dying in the desert trying to trying to cross over. And now I talked to this guy who's uh, who's deaf, and he signed um, out. Uh, the experience of trying to make it across the border and getting picked up by los, the Zetas. And he was with two guys that got beheaded in front of him um, because you can't get close to the border now without paying 
the coyotes and the coyotes paying organized crime. And so as we've restricted access to the border, um, if you don't pay the cartels effectively uh, and have a password, you'll, you'll get murdered. Uh, and in this one stretch of desert, um, the guys who don't have the money to pay these inflated rates because the business, the cost of admissions gone up so much um, are muling drugs for the cartels. That's the only way that you, you know you can that they'll leave you alone, basically, and let you get across. Um, I don't have a solution for all of our our, our border system. I, I, there's probably a saturation point. You know, I think that um, I don't know where that is. I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, I think, um, and the more sort of, I mean, you can see it with metering is the policy of the Trump said, you know, we're only going to take so you have to show up uh, and seek asylum at a at a border post. And we're only going to take 100 people a day to hear that. So you get these long lines of people that are now in these camps and and um, and women and children who are getting preyed on uh, for by sexual violence and sold into you know by traffickers. Um, and, and there's another caravan started. There's there's another one yeah, there's another one coming up. Yeah, I don't, I don't think people are going to stop that. I, mean, I don't think you know, that's really realistic. But, but they're more likely now to pay organized crime to get there, and they're more likely to now find ways to evade going to the border post since we're, we're not taking anyone, basically. So I think it's, it's sort of ironic that the more we try to control it, you know, the more we funnel people in through the cracks and... And, and looking for ways around the system. Uh, I think we've actually got a great system for, for vetting people, you know. Um, I think more, we probably need to spend more money in the immigration judges. We need to hire more judges so they can speed up that, you know, that process, I think, rather than, uh, than what's happening now. Any other questions? These are good questions. Do you have any more? I mean, do you? Feel free to. I, my questions are endless. Yeah. It's endless, it's like your book. I like, just a little feedback for you. I like that interview with Dagoberto Gutierrez, uh -huh. the best. Oh, yeah? He was like this cynical old Marxist. He just <laughs> told him like it is. And he wouldn't go tell you what he wanted to hear yeah. or whatever. He just said, look, yeah. this is what I think is coming out. I thought that was, that was my favorite part of your book, which I probably to everyone who attended. Uh, very nice. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I thought he was just a master raconteur. Yeah. yeah. And he, I think, I said in the book, he, he said, he, yeah, he, he uh, tells these stories like somebody who's exasperated, tired of the particular story that he has to tell, but still has an acerbic joy in, in its telling. And I think, yeah, he just he told it like it is. Um, he was like almost a character out of like a Marquez novel. And I had that sense like listening to him sitting there in his office with Marx on the wall and, you know, just this wry, he wasn't going to, yeah, he wasn't going to, he was going to control the narrative and the pacing. And I just got to sit there and take it in, you know. So, yeah. Thank you guys for coming tonight, really. Um, it's, it's grim stuff and, uh, and it's a wet night. So thank you very much. Appreciate it.